Thank you so much for joining us today for the second part of the Infrastructural Inequalities, Resistant Media and Abolitionist Futures public program. My name is Astra Larange. I'm a lecturer here in the School of Art and Design at UNSW and a member of both the Media Futures Hub and the Infrastructural Inequalities Research Network who are jointly bringing you this program. To begin, we'd like to acknowledge the Wongal and Larrakia peoples on whose ceded lands we, Andrew Brooks, Liam Greeley and me, live and work on. We'd also like to acknowledge the Gadigal people on whose unceded lands we are calling from today. We acknowledge that this, in this settler colony, the work of abolition began with invasion and continues because of tireless struggles against occupation. We also acknowledge that what we might call media, the forms and practices by which we forge relations transform knowledge, articulate common meanings and seek truth have long included the making of fugitive publics and the freight of sensitive information against power and towards freedom. We honour that history today as we recognise the unbroken sovereignty and as we pay our respects to elders past and present, as well as to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us today. We also want to acknowledge resistance against settler colonialism across the world and pledge our solidarity today to everyone in Palestine fighting for liberation. So this session follows the session last Friday, critiquing the carceral state, organising abolitionist futures. Today, we centre media making as a resistant and abolitionist practice. The session today will begin after this brief introduction with a conversation between me and Alison Whitaker. I will then hand over hosting duties to my collaborator, Liam Greeley, who will facilitate a discussion with Rocket Bretherton and Johanna Bell. If you have a question at any point during the session, feel free to submit it as a comment on the YouTube live stream at any point. Andrew Brooks will be monitoring the stream and will convey questions to us during the allotted time after the two more formal discussions. There should be plenty of time for questions and also hopefully an opportunity for the presenters to engage with each other. So our three panelists have produced award-winning media works that represent the harms and injustices of incarceration, both inside prison, as well as the carceral web that extends throughout society and everyday life. Their work encourages consideration of how reportage, advocacy, activism, scholarship, poetics, and storytelling can represent the lived experiences of incarceration, re-entry, coronial investigations, as well as how different formats and genres allow us to witness various aspects of carceral violence. The podcast, poem, Twitter thread, article, essay, and so on, provide different opportunities to articulate the violence of the carceral state, as well as to speak to different audiences and to engage an abolitionist imagination. What unites our panelists is a conviction that alternative media is necessary to facilitate critical dialogue around policing, imprisonment and carceral capitalism. This conviction is both a critique of mainstream media and its tendency to reproduce carceral logic in reports on police, prisons and the legal infrastructures that connect them. This happens through the use of passive language to describe police violence, reliance on state departments for information and fact checking, emphasis on criminality or fixation on innocent guilty binary, and either under-reporting or falsely reporting on anti-carceral activism. As Alison Whitaker writes in No News is No News, COVID-19 and the Opacity of Australian Prisons, an essay which describes the carceral silence deepened by increased restrictions and surveillance during 2020 in the midst of the pandemic, what we know about the condition of prisons and the impacted risks experienced by incarcerated people across the country is largely to do with independent First Nations media and efforts made by formerly incarcerated people to counter popular narratives of correction. Whittaker herself is part of this effort. Her commitment to bringing live reportage of coronial inquests via Twitter threads has become a central channel for both information and critical legal commentary to be accessed in real time by a broad public. As a legal scholar and a poet, her attention to the language of state power and the particular poetics of accountability or its absence that defines the genre of the inquest has been invaluable to a greater understanding of how deaths in custody become normalized, even naturalized in the accepted narrative that underscores carceral logic. Johanna Bell and Rocket Bretherton worked as co-creators of the podcast Bird's Eye View 
Bird's Eye View is a magazine podcast narrated by a chorus of characters in prison and about prison, produced over two years. It represents the incarcerated women of Sector 4 at Darwin Correctional Centre as more than statistics or the numbers assigned at admission, with close attention paid to the gendered inequities of incarceration. As listeners, we are brought into intimate proximity to women's experiences of incarceration, the events that have brought them there and their aspirations upon release. As Rocket notes of the carceral system in the Australian Poetry Journal, if I were you, I'd make some bloody changes. Today, we hope the discussion helps us to think collectively about the role of media making in abolitionist politics and organising. Um, so thanks again so much for joining us and thanks to Alison Whitaker, um, our first guest and um, my conversation um, partner this morning. So thanks so much, Alison, um, for joining us. Um, so I'll just launch straight into the first question, if, if that's all right. Um, uh, in a recent article, uh, which I mentioned in my introduction on the carceral silence that surrounds prisons in Australia and the lack of reportage um, outside of, um, as you say, First Nations media and activist media networks, um, you speak about the different ways that the violence of incarceration is protected by complex, complex legal issues, surveillance and media dependence on state departments for information on what happens inside. Your article's title, No News is No News, points to how during a crisis like COVID-19, uh, the gap between inside and outside widens, isolating incarcerated people even further from families and communities and insulating the public from the reality of incarceration. Um, from your perspective, what role does the mainstream media play in prison infrastructure and in the reproduction of the carceral logic of settler legal frameworks? Mm. Um. The question, I guess, is like the answer to the question is that mainstream media play a really central role in the law and order politics across this continent that actually underscores a lot of the legitimacy of prisons, as well as, I guess, kind of testing with mainstream publics um, degrees of exerting uh, carceral control um, and an expanding carceral net over First Nations people in particular. So one really critical example of this was um, during the COVID-19 pandemic, um, which obviously is still ongoing, but in that moment where we were quite concerned, a lot of people, about the impact that COVID-19 especially was going to have in prisons, the response from uh, corrections across the continent, and especially here in New South Wales, was actually to effectively lock prisons outside of the, the networks, um, sorry, um, <laughs> to kind of um, isolate prisoners from their usual support networks that come from outside of prisons, like their family support services. So Deadly Corrections, which is um, just a, an incredible organisation here in Sydney um, that is driven by community expertise and lived experience, did a survey that suggested um, about 100% of the people they spoke to who were outside had really deep and grave concerns for the well-being of their loved ones inside. But that wasn't a concern that we were seeing being reflected in media, again, because of that kind of safeguarding of legitimacy. What we did see, um, the stories coming in through media, were sources um, principally from the, the state, especially from corrective services, press releases, from official sources, and often from the ministry, um, that were really preoccupied with this security discourse that um, was about keeping people quite far away from these support networks and isolating prisoners inside. Mm. And this was happening while there was a really concerted effort from the community, um, especially led by First Nations people who had been inside or who had lost loved ones inside previously to get people out. But there was very limited reporting on the conditions that people were living in inside. And during the COVID-19 pandemic, what that looked like for a lot of people was effective lockdown in their cells, um, swabbing and testing. Um, we heard stories from people who were released under emergency measures, talking about guards threatening um, threatening people inside with having to clean the, the cells of suspected COVID-19 cases, and that kind of becoming a locus of control. And during this, there were um, I guess you could describe them as uprisings or protests um, that were actually occurring within prisons in New South Wales in support of the Black Lives Matter movement, which was very much growing on the outside and being driven from voices on the inside. 
Um, and so that accumulated in what's, I think, quite a famous image now, at least in the circles that, that I run in and um, in people who are interested in prison abolition and exposing the conditions of prisons inside, where people were arranging, um, young men inside were arranging their T-shirts, which they had taken off, to spell BLM as a drone kind of came overhead. And the reason that the drone was overhead was because there was media attention uh, on what was happening next door to the field where these people were arranging the BLM jumpers, um, which was that people were effectively being tear gassed, handcuffed, lined up in the adjacent yard. And there was very limited opportunity for those people inside to describe the events in their own terms on what actually happened. And so corrective services quite quickly were eager to talk about this drug crisis that they say was happening in prisons because people from the outside were no longer allowed to come into the inside. And so they said this was about a disputed uh, drone drug drop. And it's a narrative that has really concerningly, I guess, continued and escalated throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, where we even saw, I think it was in May of 2020, um, the New South Wales government actually using a, a tabloid press, the Daily Telegraph, to float the idea that um, they should actually ban mail, which was one of the few avenues for people inside to actually communicate with their loved ones on the outside, um, because they said there was a bupropion wafer that they found on a children's painting. Um, and so obviously that's quite concerning because there's so few avenues for people inside to directly talk to people on the outside and expose these crackdowns, these genuinely terrifying, um, I guess, limits to individual liberty inside, um, which of course limits our capacity, especially during the, the BLM movement that really blossomed around that same time to actually have them at the front and telling their stories and speaking as the, the agents and analysts that they are to be able to present their own case of what needs to happen in order for them to be free. Um, and so the media has a really critical role in that, in that kind of reality testing that corrections do to see if, I guess, like effectively how far they can push it before there's pushback. But they also have this controlling idea of legitimacy in which um, families who've received word from loved ones inside about what's going on to the people they care about are unable to, um, well, they approach media, but they're knocked back because they're not seen as legitimate sources. There's very few ways to verify. And the few courses of people being able to go inside who are journalists um, or who are academics are kind of forced into complicity um, with a number of kind of obscure sections um, in law, especially through the ethics review process in order to, to access or to speak to people inside, which in New South Wales requires that um, you, upon penalty of um, up to five years in prison, have to disclose um, if somebody has... Uh, disclosed an indictable offence to you that's not previously been known to police or to corrections, that you have a positive legal obligation to report on that uh, and to effectively criminalise them. And that's that dirty exchange that you get in order to get that direct access. Obviously, that's really, really chilling. Um, and I don't think the mainstream media fully appreciate their complicity in that. Yeah, that's that's such an interesting point. I guess the um, it kind of leads into my next question about the work that you do to really unpack those legal infrastructures that um, impede access to to people inside, and and I think also a great setup for for the conversation with Yo and Rocket about what happens um, when you actually get that access to the inside and how you kind of make media in response to that. Um, so just to kind of think more about some of those um, legal infrastructures as a legal scholar, a lot of your work considers the different ways that law, policing and prisons are practiced via really specific speech acts and language practices that come to naturalise the carceral system um, and to kind of uphold these, these logics of um, discipline. You speak in particular about the coronial inquest as a structure in which responsibility is continually deferred and denied and in which a disturbing language of death by natural causes is deployed to describe instances of violence, abandonment, neglect and refusal of care in which individual culpability is deemed impossible to determine. Um, and I know there's been a lot of that going on at the moment in the various coronial inquests that you've been reporting on. 
what is the importance for you um, as a scholar in analysing these socio-discursive aspects of carcerality um, from the language used in everyday contexts and in the media um, to narratives presented by witnesses um, to the official accounts of coroners? How does legal scholarship offer um, an intervention into these language practices of policing and imprisonment? Mm. So this research started, um, I guess, and for, for myself, I acknowledge that this kind of body of scholarship has a really long precedent that's far behind me and I stand on that shoulder. Um, for me, it started uh, in 2017 um, when there was a, a lot of voicing of these concerns that, as you were saying, individual responsibility wasn't being borne out in the system. Um, and so I tracked uh, 149 deaths in custody since the Royal Commission through to see effectively what legal structures, um, by discipline, a lawyer uh, and a legal scholar, um, what kind of legal structures were resulting or responsible for um, effectively this obfuscation of responsibility for First Nations deaths in custody for making it seem almost as if we're on this inevitable path towards death. Um, and what I found was that the, the law itself couldn't fully describe it because it was built on these ideas and took them for granted. Um, and so I was especially interested in this compulsory site that all deaths in custody, First Nations or otherwise, go through, which is the coronial inquest, which is mandatory for, for any death in custody effectively since the Royal Commission. And what was in there, most coroners, um, they, they see their role and certainly they're legislated to um, simply find the, the cause and the manner of death. Um, and these kind of really kind of complex, um, I guess you call them like biomedical impulses uh, are constantly driven to see things that are inherently, that they perceive to be inherently wrong with the First Nations body that like doom us to, to death or whatever. Um, and in some ways, the coroner's court is structured and built, so that's the only thing that it can see. But it's difficult to articulate that, um, I guess, as a legal scholar, where you can point to particular structures and sections of a, a coroner's act or kind of precedence or um, that kind of unspoken discretion of culture that exists in the coroner's court. Um, but what you can point to is the language that it produces that is not just some kind of abstract discursive uh, thing or it's not just uh, a cause um, of these kind of lack of prosecution. It has a really, really meaningful impact for families who also have to, to sit there and to, to repeatedly be told um, these, the, the knowledge that the coroner's court is capable of producing about First Nations bodies, which is actually pathologizing the violence of the state that brought their death to the coroner in the first place. So we would see a lot of patronizing language in this space that talks about First Nations deaths in custody as sad um, or as tragic, especially. And this designation of natural causes, which a lot of people point to, especially in the shadow of the anniversary of the Royal Commission into Aboriginal deaths in custody earlier this year, to say, well, X amount of First Nations deaths in custody in that period have been of natural causes, would have happened anyway. And there's no interrogation of, um, I guess, the, the processes by which um, something is designated natural causes, but there's also very little critical understanding of what natural causes means as if it's this kind of um, divine truth of inculpability um, that a coroner can bestow upon someone. So recently we've had um, in the coroner's court in New South Wales uh, and the inquest into the death of uh, Nathan Reynolds, who was um, a, a father who passed away um, because of a very prolonged asthma attack in which he was denied care um, by officers that refused to do anything but walk towards him. Um, and then when they did eventually turn up, they offered um, no medical assistance. And what they instead did um, was focused on uh, disciplining and keeping people away as much as they could from Nathan unless they were offering medical assistance, which it's difficult to see in something that is then designated a natural cause as death, actually what it means to deliberately restrict care from someone, to treat them with that prolonged callousness. Um, and that's something that intersects as well with uh, our broader understanding of 
um, the biomedical model of disability and how that's kind of being challenged as well. So what actually happened, um, even though it seems like a very, very small concession um, and certainly in the scale of where we need to be, it is, the coroner said that it, uh, the manner of Nathan's death was natural causes contributed to um, by the treatment that he received in there. And obviously that's its own obfuscation, but it's telling how very, very rare it is, um, even in the natural causes discourse, for that contribution of these systems to be recognised. Nathan, when he was out in the community, um, when he was surrounded by his family and resources, had managed his asthma almost without event um, for most of his natural life. Um, and then the, just the four months in which he was placed in that centre, um, his treatment and his restricted access to medical care and what I'm not afraid to call it quite deliberate neglect, um, accumulated in his death. And that seems like a really perverse outcome to just call natural causes. Um, and his sisters said as much throughout the inquest and in the press surrounding and since. And so that's a really powerful narrative to counter um, because that is not only... I guess, impactful in its own right. It's uh, a truth that must be told that somebody killed this person. This person didn't just um, die from nothing. And that, I guess, the, the responsible actor that we think of is the, the state and people who work within corrections. But it also has a really meaningful impact on what the coroner's court can offer people um, in terms of what recommendations the coroner can push for and the family can then use to leverage in future campaigns, but also whether something can be referred to prosecutors um, if there's potential uh, liability. And that, of course, is a, a highly contentious issue and one that um, we encounter very rarely because the threshold is put so high to be even to be able to begin to see this violence. And so we have to really keep pushing. And you're also a poet and, and, and some of your poetry has also dealt with the material of the coronial inquest and with the coroner's report as a certain type of um, material artifact. Um, and so in Black Work, you have a distributed sequence of documentary poems that take key legal cases as their source material. I believe it's only one that actually takes a, um, a coroner's report as its material. And that poem is Exhibit Tab, which uses the coronial inquest um, findings following the death in custody of a young woman, um, Miss Do in Western Australia. The poem arranges the most common three word phrases in the um, findings into a very unsettling lyric that reveals the predominant focus of the case. So despite the coroner's, um, as you say, quite sort of, um, uh, a language of tragedy and sadness. In fact, the, the, the case's predominant language uh, refers to state actors, to state infrastructures and to bureaucratic processes. Um, and so this, the, these poems, these documentary poems and exhibit habit in particular bring together your work as a commentator, as a scholar and as a poet by thinking about how these documents that describe state violence far from being mere records of legal proceedings, are in fact the material of the law in its performance and in its reinscription of settler sovereignty and state power at every instance um, of utterance. Um, how do you see the poem as a form quite distinct from the work you do, for example, on Twitter or in a journal article um, and with different protocols of reading as part of the larger project of abolition? Um, in other words, what can a poem do that other media formats can't? Yeah, I mean, that's an excellent question. I'm not sure that poetry can do anything that you can't also do somewhere else. Um, but I think it invites a, a new audience. Um, and at the risk of um, sounding pretentious, um, it invites uh, a haunting, I guess, of the subject. It, it, it um, people tend to carry what they hear in poetry much more closely, um, and it echoes within them a little bit more than, um, I guess, something like a tweet or a journal article. Um, the the difficulty that I had um, in bringing this poem um, around was, um, I guess, this this logic of the law right that fails to see itself consistently that is constantly, especially in the coroner's court, preoccupied with um, this, with picking apart um, this person who was loved and cherished and had a full life outside of what the state did to them. And when I was interested in kind of beginning to write on um, 
coroner's inquests and these legal structures, it was very, very hard because of that logic, because all of the information was focused on the, the subject of the inquest, the person who had died and who was loved and had that full life. It was difficult to not reproduce that in the poem. And so what I had to do to produce exhibit tab and similar poems to it was actually automate the process um, because it was difficult to write a poem about the inquest that was not an account of Ms. Du that again did her that in, that same injustice that the inquest did to her. Um, and so in, in, in writing that poem, I put, um, I put uh, the coroner's document, the findings into um, a search engine optimizer, which could actually pick out the most common three word phrases. And then I used that to, to rank them um, by the number of times that they appeared in the document. And in doing so, you can uh, kind of force um, a, a kind of meta meaning from the document, um, which is an account of itself and what its own priorities are in the knowledge that it produces. And the poem itself um, reveals, and it, this was before I started really substantively the research that we're talking about today, um, but that poem effectively just produced the same conclusion that the research did. And it didn't take that same degree of time. And it had, I guess, a much clearer focus on the inquest um, than some of the research does. And so I think um, it's important to attend to poetry as a methodology when we can, because it has that attentiveness to, to language and to power. Um, and for, for people who work within the legal system in order to, to seek this critical justice or to criticize legal systems or to push towards a, a radical rethink, abolition, a new future, it's important to be able to think about how we express it. Um, and in so doing, actually learn new things about the substance of what we're saying, not just the way in which we're putting it forward. Thank you so much for that answer. It's such a fantastic statement of poetics, I think. And um, yeah, it's very gratifying for me personally to hear as someone who's um, really interested in the connection between your poetry and, and the other work you do. So I've, I've alluded a few times um, in my introduction and in my questions to the work that you do on Twitter. So the final question I have for you is, is about that work specifically. So you've worked tirelessly to provide intensive real-time accounts of coronial inquests via Twitter. Your capacity to summarise the legal as well as the social, political and cultural significance of the inquest's operations has been invaluable to many different communities working against the carceral state and towards prison abolition. What impact do you think your Twitter reportage has had and what are both the possibilities and limits of using Twitter as a platform to who and for, who, for whom is your work directed on Twitter and what do you see as the future of abolition work both on and offline? Sorry, just a few like really simple, quick questions there. Okay, <laughs> I'll do my best, I'll do my best. Um, first, I wanted to, to flag that this work is kind of ongoing um, and I wanted to direct um, anybody who's listening um, to donate to the Justice for Fella campaign, um, which you can find uh, at a GoFundMe link, which I did supply to Andrew, so it might be popping up um, in various places now. Um, it supports the family of Wayne Feller Morrison, who are going through an inquest that is especially crucial to document for its cruelty, um, something very unique since the Royal Commission is taking place in South Australia um, at the moment, and it's happening to um, people who loved Wayne um, very deeply and who have been fighting for close to, it'll be five years in September, for answers on what happened to him. Um, currently officers are refusing to, uh, several officers who were in the van with uh, Wayne when he lost consciousness and over which period there's no CCTV footage um, are refusing to answer questions on what happened. And so have effectively managed to stall the inquest thus far and to deprive the family of answers. Um, and so even though the reporting, the, the minute by minute reporting on that inquest, which has been done um, a little bit by myself, but mostly by uh, Derek Scholar, Natalie Ironfield, Ironfield and um, by Roxy Moore 
uh, a Noongar lawyer human rights advocate um, who are currently doing that work. Um, it's critical to document the silences as well and to kind of in the same way that we're talking about the poetry to begin to understand how these systems do their thinking by showing not just the findings, not just the end product of that thinking, but the really, in, in this case, especially the really ugly, dehumanizing, um, obstructive ways in which that is taking place. Um, so I really encourage anybody who can to, to support um, that GoFundMe, to sign on to the Families Pledge, um, to ban spit hoods, not just in South Australia, but across the continent. Um, and to pay attention to the reportage from the inquest, which is happening on Twitter, hashtag justice for fella, um, and also on Indigenous X, where daily reports are coming through. Um, and I think just for the being able to expose, um, I guess, the, the violence and the impunity of these systems, it make Twitter is a uh, immensely valuable form um, because people can respond and in doing so create their kind of own text um, and also people can observe um, in the same place that they get most of their information. A lot of the difficulty of live tweeting inquests is one of the reasons that there's so few court reporters um, in inquests but also just generally. Um, Court reporting is immensely difficult. It actually does entail some legal risks that fall directly on the journalist. Um, in New South Wales, I can speak to, um, it's very, very difficult to get um, access to suppression order registers. Um, they don't actually keep track of the number of suppression orders that are issued in the coroner's court. Um, it, there are a lot of counterintuitive rules about what can and can't be reported, what can and can't be tweeted, especially. Um, and there's also that guard of institutional legitimacy um, where um, exemptions to transmit from court, so to issue a tweet, um, are usually only afforded to journalists who are connected with the media organisation. And so that presents its own difficulties and its own hurdles to get through. Um, but again, also, kind of demonstrates that same logic of um, elevating the idea of law as kind of beyond any other discursive proceeding that would take place. Um, and so it's really, really critical that we, we document and push as hard as we can. Um, as for the future of the abolitionist movement, I'm actually, I don't wanna be one of those people who says there's a silence and then actually not represent what people are sincerely saying about and through that silence. Um, and so as to what the future of abolitionist organizing is, uh, I think that is going to be led by people who are inside and people who have experience of being inside prisons. Um, and so maybe to wrap up, Astrid, I might um, quote from a statement that was released um, by those protesters who put down, who laid down the t-shirts um, and by a, a group organizing within Long Bay Correctional Facility um, that they released uh, a week after that incident. So I'll just share it with you now. We prisoners passionately embrace the commitment of Black Lives Matter, other organizations and people to force change on the way authorities degrade, attack and kill us. The public saw them gas us at Long Bay Prison on Monday, June 8. That was standard treatment. There was no de-escalation, negotiation or use of intermediaries. There was no permission for our representative inmate development committee to speak to the media about our views on the George Floyd killing, the David Dungay killing, and the changes recommended by the coroner in David Dungay's inquest. We couldn't report on how nothing has changed and the certainty that deaths in custody will continue through this brutal treatment. Please help us have our voices heard in all of these forums, rather than be dehumanized as though we are of no value and as if we have no rights. Thank you so much, Alison. Thank you so much for such amazing answers to those questions. Um, I'm gonna hand over to Liam now and Alison and I will be back at the end of the session for any questions and discussions. So thank you so much, deeply appreciate it and see you soon.
I'm not on mute anymore. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Liam. I live and work for the Housing for Health Incubator on Larrakee Country and for the University of Sydney. Um, it's my pleasure today to talk with Johanna Bell and Rocket Bretherton. Uh, Johanna Bell is an award-winning author, most widely known for her Cheeky Dog books, Cheeky Dogs books, co-authored with Dion Beasley. She's also founder of Spun, the Northern Territory's most popular live storytelling event and director of Story Projects, a Darwin-based production house that specialises in strengthening communities through storytelling, including the Bird's Eye View podcast. Rocket Bretherton was a co-creator of that series, one of many. Rocket has Noongar heritage and was raised by a Waka Waka family on Bribie Island. She spent most of her adult life in and out of prison, and before Bird's Eye View, she hadn't shared her story with many people. Now, Rocket is an advocate for Northern Territory women with lived experience of incarceration. She's currently training to deliver drug and alcohol programs in prison and earlier this year led successful action against defunding the Women of Worth program. Together, Johanna, Rocket and their collaborators were nominated for a Walkley Award and they won Podcast of the Year at the Australian Podcast Awards in 2020 and the 2020 Fitzgerald Justice Award. Uh, Yo, Rocket and I co-authored an essay for the most recent issue of the Infrastructural Inequalities Journal, and it's wonderful to have them in conversation today. Um, before we begin, though, we all felt it would be helpful for everyone to listen collectively to a short extract from Bird's Eye View. I never meant to be here. It was about 4.30 in the morning. It was raining. I heard my little brother calling me out to help me. Help me cause the sprayed him with a pepper spray. And then I just ran back, got the stick, and I whacked the police officer. I got put in the back of a paddy wagon. And I remember sitting there cross-legged in the back thinking, oh, fuck. This is my seventh time in this jail. And then Brisbane jail, I've done two sentences as well. Brisbane's my favourite. You get a better choice <laughs> of women there. <laughs> well, this time around, it's different. I gave my loyalty to the wrong people. Here in Darwin Correctional Centre in Sector 4, we've got a flock full of corallas, and they always call out, We've got the kulu, white cockatoo, eagle, owl, goose, black crows, plovers. And they're so annoying because they only scream out loud when we get locked down. When I see the birds in sector four, I think, why the fuck are you in here? Bird's Eye View, a podcast made with women in the Darwin Correctional Centre, launching on International Women's Day, March 8th. Put it in your diary and subscribe wherever you get your podcast. Will we ever know? Will we ever know if it was all worth my eyes okay um rocket i might begin with you uh those for whom that was the first they've heard of the podcast could you describe a little bit about what it's about um there's 12 storytellers and um we um ask three main questions like uh, we come up with three main questions for the podcast, like uh, who are we really, um, how did we get here and where to from, where 
where to next. And um, so the 12 storytellers, and then there's over 70 women who help collaborate on the podcast. Um, and we answer those three questions. And then also, like, we have a lot of fun as well. Like, we give you a tour of Sector 4 and, and the Septicon and, and um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. You know, as producer, did you want to add anything? Uh, look, yeah, thanks, Rocket. Um, that was a the, that was pretty much the guts of it. I'd just also add that um, I suppose what separates Bird's Eye View um, from lots of other media that happens about stories in inside prison and also with um, people on the outside with lived experience of incarceration is that we used a community cultural arts development process to make a podcast. So we didn't actually even know that we were making a podcast initially. Um, it was very much, um, you know, enter the prison, uh, work with people, um, try to understand, um, you know, where things are at and then see what comes out of that. And what did come out was this chorus of women's voices and a range of segments, you know, from as diverse as audio essays, poetry, celebrity interviews, beauty hacks. Um, there was parodies, you know, on podcast ads and all sorts of things. So what the podcast was really attempting to do was um, to challenge that very narrow idea that, women who end up in prison are worthless which was something that all the women very early on articulated as a belief of theirs that people on the outside thought that at the end of the day if you boiled it down they were damaged worthless and irredeemable but the reality was something much more nuanced and complex and interesting um you know I, rocket was there when we did this activity um we, we listed all the horrible things that people thought people thought of them and then name you know listed things that uh people in the room didn't know about each other and I I mean I knew it was going to be interesting but I didn't think that there would be a a state show jam jumping championship I didn't think there'd be someone with a helicopter license um I didn't I didn't think there'd be a photographer a published poet someone in an all-female rock band. Um, so, you know, the list just goes on about all these incredible things that are outside of that very narrow narrative that we get peddled by mainstream media, that idea that people who end up in prison, women even more so than men in many cases, um, are worthless. So that's what the podcast was really about. Um, and I, I think it's interesting because this session's about resistant media. Um, and in fact, the first time I heard that phrase, I had to look it up because we didn't actually set out to make resistant media. I think the podcast was about redistributing power um, and addressing what um, it, what is essentially acute voice poverty up here in the Northern Territory, whereby, and it, this is a national phenomenon, I feel like it's more overt here. There are some groups up here who are unseen and unheard, and I think probably none more so than women locked up in a men's prison. Thank you both. Um, it's, I won't go on about it, but it, it's such a, an incredible collaborative project and you're obviously such good mates now, but could you say a little bit and perhaps rock it first about when you met for the first time and then how you came to work together initially and sort of how you felt about it then, what your expectations were and, and then, you know, how that obviously may have changed a bit across the course of the project and afterwards. Yeah, at first I had, like, no expectations. I was like, who's this woman and what's she doing? And she had, uh, the second time I met her, she had Leah with her and I'm like, oh, who's that woman? And I'm like, oh, I go up and see what they're doing and they had like biscuits and, sh and stuff so I, I went up to the library and you know it was a program something to do which there's none of in sector four in Darwin Correctional Centre so I was like yeah go up there and then they're talking about doing this like 
you know, a storytelling project and whatever. And I'm just like, yeah, right, whatever. And then they're like, we want to record you. And I'm like, oh, fucking dogs. Like, what do they want to record me for? And they're like, oh, no, you're going to get a good, you're going to get a say in everything. And I'm like, yeah, sure, sure, sure. And then as time went on, like, it took them a while to bring in, like, the microphones and then they brought one in and we were passing it around, playing around with it and stuff. And we started building a relationship. Um, Leah was the one who did most of my um, story. And, like, building the relationship, Leah, like, divulged a lot about herself, a lot of personal stories, and we really built a lot of trust up. Like, at, at first... I was just like, yeah, who are these gammon cunts? I mean, gammon people, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> and, <laughs> and um, <laughs> yeah, um, but then by the, by the end, um, it was a collaborative um, thing because I got to edit my story 17 times. <laughs> I had the most edits out of anyone. Um, you know, it... Yeah, I'm lost. <laughs> no, well, before before um, this project, I'd never really, I didn't really know what a podcast was. And then, like, Yo brought in a podcast for us all to listen to, and I listened to it, and I'm like, oh yeah, I sort of heard podcasts just before I went in. They started getting big, but um, when I was in jail, like, I didn't know how big they had gotten. Um, and you know, I sort of maybe when we'll do it, when we decided that we we're doing a podcast, I thought, you know maybe a thousand maybe at the most three thousand people might listen to us and I was like oh a bit nervous and everything and now I think we're at over three hundred thousand downloads is that right yo yeah that that is right um I just want to jump back to that um moment that you described um when Leah and I first came in and you're kind of like who are who are these people and what do they want because I remember in the first session um, and I should also um, say that I'd never been inside a correctional centre before I started working on this project. I, I have a background in social research and program evaluation and in community arts, um, but I hadn't had any reason. And I felt quite ashamed, actually, but prior to working on this project, I didn't know that there were women in the Darwin, Darwin Correctional Centre. I just thought it was a men's place. And... Um, so I was, it was a pretty steep learning curve for me, but we ended up in this little library and I'll just paint the picture for you. It's like the size of a demountable. It's got the weirdest collection of books, which Rocket told me on day one was all the ones that the bloke didn't want. The men's library, they passed over to the women. So there was sort of like these kind of Mills and Boons kind of weird erotic things. There were Chinese English dictionaries, like big, long kind of whole shelf worth you know, very strange collection of books. There we are. Um, there's a, a good mix of women, maybe about 15 women from um, all different backgrounds, three quarters of whom um, First Nations women. And uh, we were getting, Leah and I were getting sussed out. And I didn't know like how rare, you know, solid trust is inside prison. Um, but we were kind of getting put through the the grill a bit and people were saying like, why are you doing this and what's in it for you? Um, and so from sort of day one, we had to work pretty hard to establish that this wasn't about us. This was a, a process of elevation, um, an opportunity for women to have a go at something new, that we weren't corrections. Um, and we were lucky the library was the only room that didn't have a camera in it. Um, and so we chose it for the sound quality originally because it had a couch and the books made it sound a bit softer. But what it created was a bit of a space because Rocket will tell you like outside of that library in the yard, everywhere else, women do not have control over very much at all. Like, do you want to paint a picture of what it's like, you know, from getting up to... Yeah, know, sure. Yeah. yeah, so in the morning you're woken up by uh, a loud voice at 7.30 and then you're told to muster up, you, like you have to wear the, the uniform every day, you have, you're told where to stand, you're told what to eat, you're told, you're told everything about your day, you're told whether or not your visit will go ahead, 
Like you have no control over anything. Um, it's pretty mundane. Yeah, it's pretty. It's pretty crap. Um, yeah. So it's just about control. Um, corrections controlling you and dehumanizing you and can like like all day over and over dehuman dehumanizing you in different ways shapes and forms um you know it could be anything from you know telling you your visit's not turning up because you're talking or something you know just just being corrections really um some of the things that really shocked me um initially was the description that one of the women gave about you're not allowed to kind of express too much emotion at either end of the spectrum. So if you're caught like laughing or kind of jumping around, people think contraband drugs have got in and, you know, you're going to be punished for that. Yeah. If you, if you caught um, crying, you get put on watch. So what you've got is this like narrowing of the, the emotional experience and women were described it as kind of just operating in this gray zone where they had to have this sort of poker face all the time. And so we knew pretty early on um, that inside that library space, when we were running the program, we had to have a really different understanding of rules of engagement was that like very early on making it known that we were humans, that we do have feelings, that they were able to be expressed in the room and that that could be done, um, you know, safely. Um, You can't, you know, all the yard politics, you can't leave it entirely at the door, but I think we did. But for eight weeks, we spent time just building rapport, getting to know each other before we even brought a mic in. And then we got permission to bring one mic in and that we sort of moved that around the group. It was a lot of kind of getting to know you, um, you know, getting getting confidence, building up confidence, getting an understanding of like what, you know, clean, clean audio is like as opposed to like all the mic handling interference and sort of very basic level stuff. And then um, I think it was about maybe at the three or four mark, four month mark, we got permission to actually bring the audio kit in. And that was when there was, we had a really great trust base and, um, and we were able to sort of um, tackle some of the skills building stuff, which then led to this montage of different voices and also um, different experiments on the mic. Because what we thought we were going to make, like I, I did have some ideas about what was possible when we first entered. And I thought what might be possible is like, an ear hustle style podcast, which is an award-winning podcast from the San Quentin Maximum Security Men's Prison outside of San Fran. And that's an outsider and an insider on the mic. And I thought that that might be manageable, you know. But when women decided that they wanted to focus on plurality and that challenging the narrow narratives, I knew that if we gave one woman the mic inside and one woman the mic on the outside, that we'd never, we wouldn't be able to demonstrate this thing, the aim that women had articulated, which was there is no one type of woman who ends up in prison, that there is this, um, you're constantly having to make editorial decisions based on the, the aim of the group, the decided sort of song sheet, which is how did we, who are we really? And who are we really needed to be tackled from lots of different directions, or it wouldn't have it wouldn't have been true to the experience of sector four. Um, I know we're probably going off question a little bit there, Liam. No, no, I think that that's a great response. And Rocket, maybe you'd like to add to that um, to describe your experience of that process of of learning both how to work with that technology and that media and understanding more and more what a podcast is and then also how it informed your sense of what makes a good storyteller and how you wanted to tell your story in particular ways. Yeah, I, um, like, we come across a few challenges. Like, first of all, the media and stuff, like, I loved it. Like, I love playing around with the Zoom and the microphones and, like, I was normally the first one up there tr- setting up all the audio equipment for us and, I love doing that and, um, you know, I've got my own Zoom now and I'm doing my own podcast now. Um, that's how much I loved it. Um, 
And what was the second part of your question? Uh, how your how participating in the project um, shifted your ideas about what makes a good storyteller, and also how you wanted to tell have your story told. I had no idea what makes a good storyteller, you know. Apparently I'm one um, and, I, you know, I didn't really know that or, I, you know, I didn't really believe it. I'm like, yeah, all right, whatever. I, I thought they were just, you know, building me up and I'm like, yeah. But, I mean, I've been told quite a few times now that I'm a pretty good storyteller, which is great. <laughs> um, you know, uh, with my story, we had it a certain way and then, um, lawyers went and looked over it and they said, you know, you're open to defamation cases and everything if, you know, you name the perpetrator or whatever. So they come to me, Yo and Leah come to me and they said, like, we've got to, we've got to change a little bit. And I'm like, no, nah, it takes away my whole story. I don't want to do that. And they're like, and Leah's like, no, no, can you trust me? And I'm like, yeah, whatever. Um, and I was ready to pull my whole story. I was like, no, nah, don't want to even play your game. Go away. But then I listened to it and I was like, oh, hang on. This actually sounds really good. Yeah. So um, I listened to it, changed it 17 times, as I've mentioned, and it came across really well. And I'm really happy with how it come across. Um, it, it was great. Yeah. Mm, Turned out pretty good. And, and continuing on with what you were describing before, the way that, um, your life is so controlled and routinized while you're inside. Um, you know, when you listen to Bird's Eye View, you, you can set aside all the amazing stories and the form of the storytelling. And one of the most impressive things that you all achieve is actually getting it done inside such a secretive, coercive, violent institution. So, Rocket, perhaps you could speak to you know, uh, how though how that control impacted on your ability to participate in the project and, yo, also, you know, how were you able to negotiate the bureaucratic and the technological and the logistical hurdles to get everything across the line? Yeah, well, I'll, I ended up um, get, getting put into a red shirt, like, near the end, like, in my last three months of um, my uh, red shirt is, a high, sec is high security, um, in the last three months of my sentence, I was put into a red shirt because my mum gave me a lolly at a visit and I ate it. So, yeah, they felt that was good enough to put me in a red shirt. So I was no longer able to participate in the in the Bird's Eye View storytelling program. Like, um, Eventually, they got permission for me to come out and go into a little tiny room to finish off my last edits and stuff. But, um, you know, they had to lock down the whole of the women's sector. That's 75 other women. They had to lock in, in cages while I come out for half an hour or an hour at a time to be able to talk to Lee and Lee or Leah or Yo. Or Yo. Um, so, you know, it, it was pretty crap. But then once I was released from prison, Yo also gave me a lot of opportunities doing pickups where um, I was paid to come into the studio and do some pickups and some extras and, and it was really good. It really helped me when I got out of jail to have something to focus on, something really positive to focus on, and other than, you know, getting back on drugs and whatever. So I, I found it really helpful um, that Yo trusted me and gave me, you know, that um, that, that job of doing, doing little pickups and stuff and, you know, it helped my se sense of self-worth and, and whatnot. Yeah, it was really good. Yep. Thanks, Rocket. Um, I think uh, it's probably, in summary, every single turn in this podcast was hard and it was made harder by the way the system functions. Um, I mean, just to go back to that list earlier that Rocket was mentioning about the types of things women don't have control over, I was really shocked when I learned, you know, that prison, you know, women... In Dar imprisoned in Darwin don't automatically get access to a fan, that fans are a privilege, that they, um, the number of toilet flushes that people get, um, the length of shower times that people can shower, where women can, can and can't be in the space, the pace at which they're allowed to walk, um, move their bodies for exercise. You know, all these things that we take for granted are stripped back 
And so one of the biggest challenges was establishing a relationship inside that program and inside the library room where women felt that they actually could and would have control, editorial control. Uh, we created like a 10 step editorial po process for each of the personal audio essays that you hear on the podcast, whereby we built relationships and rapport. We did one-on-one -on -one in depth interviewing um, sometimes there were hours and hours of transcripts that were then brought back in for women who were really confident on the page. They worked through the transcripts and made edits, crossed out things that they didn't want in, highlighted things that they wanted prioritised because they knew that each story was going to be kind of cut back um, time-wise, that it was a sort of a 10 to 15 minute story, but there might have been hours of interviewing. There were things that people felt that they'd left out so they could make an indication that they wanted to do pickups. Um, for women who weren't confident on the page, they listened, re-listened to their stories and did the same thing. Um, we then took their edits back out, made an, a first version, like a rough cut of the audio, brought it back in. And when I say brought it back in, like sometimes this a month would pass between the paper edit, first paper edit and the first audio edit because We'd be booked in to see a woman, but we'd go in and they'd be at visits clinic or in Rocket's case, red shirted and off limits for 12 weeks. And we'd need to lobby really hard to get them to have access to the program again. Um, and I think that, you know, in terms of resistant media, that was one of, that was a really positive outcome inside sector four was that women who were red shirted previously had never been allowed to participate in projects, but because We'd been at it for 18 months by that stage. We were able to, you know, make a small change within the system where, where Rocket could participate even though she was at the highest level of security. Um, I mean, other things, sometimes we'd turn up, it's a 20 minute drive from here, we'd turn up and no one had told us that the entire sector was locked down because a pipe had burst and there was a male plumber in there fixing it. So all the women needed to be locked up. Um, there were other challenges like women were on, some women were on quite short sentences, so say three months and needed to be prioritised um, and ha to have their stories turned around quite quickly. And so then, you know, some of the final edits needed to be done outside um, of, of prison, which ha presented other logistical challenges, um, particularly when people weren't living uh, in Darwin. Um, I mean, just the interruptions, like you'll hear in the podcast that often like you're in the middle of hearing somebody's story and then the intercom comes in with like a code blue or just an announcement for somebody. There's just these constant interruptions. You don't, you don't really have, um, you've got to be incredibly flexible. I had to use all my diplomacy skills. And I think for, as a producer, the hardest thing was um, trying to, be on side with corrections and trying to cultivate a very deep sense of trust um, with women because sometimes women were a little bit like, why are you why are you in the office? So there's like a big kind of round eye that looks out. Uh, why are you in the office talking to the staff? What's going on in there? Um, I think probably the thing that we stuck to and I'm really proud because Sometimes I, um, I felt envious of the mainstream journos who just kind of get to whip in, do some interviews, whip out and make a story because the, the, the slow storytelling model and the, the deep collaboration is a much harder and more uncomfortable um, journey, I think. But I just tried to make sure that at every point um, we were mapping like if you, if you were mapping the collaboration, that it would be more on the deep end rather than the shallow end. So wherever women could have a say, what was in their stories, what the music sounded like, which bits had been left out. Um, and then the most incredible shift I think occurred because we were going to be a straight storytelling podcast. But then once women got skills on the mics, they just decided to take the podcast in this entirely different direction. 
And I think, you know, that was probably somewhere between the 12 and 18 month mark. Um, and Rocket will tell you, like, if you have listened, you'll hear her and one of the other prisoners, Tafe, on there talking about wheat bix and how to fix a wheat bix addiction in prison. You know, there's horoscopes, there's, you know, spoofy ads. None of those things were concepts that came from, you know, the production team. No, we were just mucking around and they come by accident. It was, yeah, cool. So, yeah. It, they turned out really well. I'm, I'm pretty happy with how they turned out. Rocket, can I ask um, when, or there is, it, to, to give an example, in the first episode, I think there's a, there's a section that's quite clever and funny where you and others are giving a tour of the prison. Um, and so for those who haven't been there, it's, you know, useful as scene setting. Um, now, who do you want to be listening to the podcast and, and what sorts of things do you want them to be hearing? You know, what is the sort of impact that you want it to have in the world? Well, I mean, it's had the, had way more of an impact than I ever expected. Like, you know, in my podcast somewhere along, the, in, my, in my part somewhere along the lines, I mentioned that if I can reach one person and inspire one person, then my life's been worthwhile, you know. And I've had so many people reach out to me on Twitter, on, you know, all sorts of platforms. I've, I've spent hours reading reviews. <laughs> um, and so, like, I've had people meet me in the street and hear my voice and go, hey, you're Rocket, you're from Bird's Eye View. And I'm like, yeah. And they're like, oh, my God, you're so inspiring. And, you know, and so I've had a, like, really positive impact, I think, in inspiring people to be, I don't know, just to be... Yeah, I don't know. Just I know that I've had a positive impact because of the uh, amount of people who have said to me, you know, you really made me think about my life and, you know, my life isn't as bad as I thought it was, you know, and, you know, you made me think of other people and, you know, my, yeah, that my life isn't as bad as it is. So I'm really happy with the impact that it had, the, pe the amount of people that it's reached. I had no, no idea that we would get 300,000 downloads. Um so it was important to you, Rocket, that it wasn't, you know, I guess the alternative is a program just inside the prison, a sort of narrative therapy type program, for example, but it, the publicness mattered. No, it didn't really matter. Um, no, not at the time of making it. Like, I didn't give a crap what people thought. Like, I really thought that it would be really negatively um, responded to and I, I didn't think I'd get... I thought all my all the reviews on Apple and Google and that would be really negative. Like, I yeah, I just I really it was the exact opposite of what I thought it would be. Um, I didn't really give a crap. Like, you know, I'm I'm me and I'm unapologetic unapologetically me. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I I really didn't care what people thought of it. I mean, I wanted people to like it as you would, but yeah. um. Yeah, I, it didn't bother me if they didn't or not. Although, you know, the, the week before it was released, I lost so much sleep. I was just like so nervous. And then I, yeah, I was like, oh crap, this is, you know, everyone's going to be so negative. And I expected a really lot, like a lot of real negative media around me. And it's just been the exact opposite. Like, um, you know, I started something yesterday about, you know, changing the conditions for the women in, in the jail about, uh, you know, um, uh, equal opportunities for work and stuff. And I've already had media reach out to me because we have formed that relationship with media. Um, and I have formed a lot of really healthy relationships with media, which, you know, I'm really happy about. But I never, never, ever in my wildest dreams could have imagined just how far it would go, you know. Mm. And Yo and I have done a lot of panels and stuff um, in the last like year and a half um, to which I've been paid for, which have been really, really good. You know, I didn't think I'd be lecturing to a bunch of uni students at all. Like, no I, doubt. I, well, they're, they're lucky to have you, Rocket. Um, so for those listening at home, that uh, campaign that Rocket has started is called the Equal Opportunities for Women in Darwin Correctional Centre. And I'll just give a quick shout out to... Um, Rocket's GoFundMe campaign for her podcast called Recovering Rocket. And just because I'm conscious of time, I'll just finish with one last question, which is, I guess, a very broad one. So 
as Astrid and Alison were discussing and the panelists on Friday, you know, in the last couple of years, there has been a lot of discussion about defunding the police, prison abolition, and so on. So how how do those discussions bear on bird's eye view and how do you see bird's eye view sitting in relation to those and perhaps you can connect it with that ongoing advocacy as well, either of you, but I'll flick to Rocket first. Oh, <laughs> um, I don't, I, no, let's flick to Yo first, hey? <laughs> uh, look, um, I think that being inside and, and making media that, you know, is about plurality and multiplicity and complexity that doesn't shy away from uncomfortable conversations um, is part of a bigger picture of change making. Um, we did not, we were in a very difficult position when we made the podcast because everything had to be signed off on by corrections. Um, and so it couldn't be directly political, um, but of course the act of making any sort of narrative-based, public narrative-based project inside a prison is uh, a political act. Um, and what's, re what's been um, really sort of um, heartwarming for me, I suppose, and a bit unanticipated is to, to watch the impact of making that podcast on Rocket in particular, but also some of the other women in terms of their exposure to media and media skills and their ability to be like a part of a, a bigger public discourse about change making um, and also to see corrections reach out in some ways uh, particularly from interstate um, and and look at narrative as a tool um, for uh, change making um, it's definitely not you know I wouldn't say the podcast ever started in the abolition space, uh, but it's part of um, a series of sort of stepping stones. And I think it is, it's slow moving when you're inside the system. Um, I don't know, Rocket, what would you say? Um, yeah, like you had to be like very diplomatic in there about what you're saying because you were scared about if it was going to get cut or not. Like I know when I spoke about, you know, like the problem that I had with, you know, periods and stuff, I thought for sure that would get cut out of the podcast, anything that um, put a negative light on corrections because corrections is such a negative space. Um, we did cut a lot out um, of negative stuff because we wanted it to be, you know, like passed off, signed off. Um, what, the, what the podcast has helped me do is it's helped, helped elevate me as a person who you know well gets listened to by media or you know it's given me a platform to start my advocacy work from and I'm like really proud of um what I'm doing now and yeah um oh I think, no, I think that's a brilliant <laughs> note to end on Rocket because I think it speaks really clearly to some of what Tabitha Lean had to say on, on Friday about um, about uh, love and pride and the sort of building up that is necessary for an abolitionist politics. And I think that's really clear both in what you've been able to do and some of the other women involved in the project, you know, while since you've been on the outside. So I might just leave it there and we will bring Alison back in. I've got my more talented co-host Astrid back. And... Um, we might throw first to, I mean, personally, we think it's um, always more lovely to hear the conversation between you guys if you have questions for one another based on the conversation that's just happened. Otherwise, we'll have a look at what's come through in the YouTube chat as well. I just want to say um, that, like, I listened to Tabitha and Deb the other day and, like, I, I love what Tabitha was saying about, you know, and I agree wholeheartedly with both of what they were saying, you know, yeah, they're both awesome people. And, you know, Debbie Kiroi has actually been like the person who inspired me to be a better person and, you know, work towards helping women and stuff.
anyone? I mean, I'm um, curious about the, if you didn't have these constraints from corrections and if corrections didn't have to sign off, um, what kind of stories do you think you would want to tell or that you would be able to tell? Listen to a recovering rocket when it, when it drops. <laughs> all right, all right, don't want to spoil anything. Mm -hmm. um, that's a, it's a really um, full on question because what we created uh, in the making of the podcast was a very rare thing in prison. Um, and I don't, I don't really love this term because it doesn't fully encapsulate, I encapsulate it, but it was a safe space. And, um, and so people revealed all sorts of things. Um, some of them were things that happened before they got in prison, which, you know, are um, the result of, system level failures in, you know, lots of different spaces. Um, some of them were horrible human rights abuses that occurred inside the prison system from very, you know, sort of small, you know, level ridiculing by staff through to blatant misuse of power and public funding. Um, things that would shock, um, things that certainly shocked me um, and and also there's just a few cases of women in there who shouldn't be in there. Um, that the there's a lot of cases of that failed, like innocence cases. And um, I have not. I don't have a legal background, and I made a faux pas when I started this process, and I've apologised to Rocket um, for that because her story was um was hampered by the fact that i didn't think to get the content legaled until we were quite far down the storytelling process what that meant was women had been given a voice and kind of led to believe that they would be able to to share in a way that they wanted to and then when um a defamation lawyer looked at it and red lit all these bits and then we had to go back and say I'm sorry, but we can't name this person. We went to the extent of looking for legal evidence to make sure that we could keep the stories as intact as possible. Um, it was a huge amount of work and it it's something that I would do really differently. I think if I had this, if I made another podcast of this kind, I would work with a trained narrative therapist because I am not. I would make sure there was a psychologist someone with training on the team so that women could continue the work that they were doing inside the narrative project on, on a more clinical level. And I would um, work with a lawyer who could help mitigate some of the risks or at least help the production team manage the many risks that exist within the system. Um, yeah. What was that like, Rocket, for you having to um, respond to those external legal needs and how they bore on the details that could and couldn't be shown in that story? Yeah, like I said earlier, like it, it almost caused me to pull my whole story. Um, it was, you know, I was hurt. Um, I was hurt that I couldn't, you know, be honest. Um, but then, you know, when they changed it around, uh, you know, and it, it still hurts a little bit, but, you know, the, the way the podcast come out, I wouldn't change a thing now. I think it's come out really well. Uh, and, you know, I did get a few little things out about, you know, human rights, about what, you know, what you have to go through in there, like the strip searches and that while you've got your period and, you know, not being allowed to change when you've got your period and, you know, not having control to a, like a fan because you've been naughty or, you know, it, it's, um, yeah, it's, it, yeah, there's more to come, but, um, you know, Corrections had to sign off on this one, so it's a little bit low-key. Call it low-key. <laughs> one thing that really strikes me and what all of you were talking about is the really complicated obfuscations that block access and that block um, narrative and that block contact and that block solidarity. And, um, and, and you know, a lot of that... We, we sort of know that the prison operates and that the power in the prison is amplified by the kind of black box structure. But I guess the degree to which these legal impediments 
um, block, you know, Rocket's story in its full content and Alison, um, you know, the restrictions on you live tweeting, that was, you know, that was quite new to me, the degree to which you're actually kind of at both at risk and also um, require a certain type of um, access in the first place to even be at that risk. Um, I guess that really highlights for me the interconnectedness of all of these different um, processes and systems um, and infrastructures. And I guess that's really the impetus of our research network is to think, well, no one person on their own can decode and penetrate and break these infrastructural connections. And in fact, we need these interdisciplinary collaborations to be able to have the legal access, this, you know, the kind of um, social and cultural and political access and to actually develop these narratives collectively. Um, and that really struck me in both of your discussions today and in your answers, just how not just collaborative, but how much um, collaboration itself requires like deep and, and trusting solidarity. Um, and I guess that's not a question, but just something I really note and something that um, I think really brings together all of the projects in a really powerful way that um, and I think is like really the part of the necessary work of, of this kind of, um, of these kinds of media practices is just even articulating the difficulty of them being in the first place. Can I just add to that, which is, um, I, I've, there's a the note about this text, but if people are interested in um, collaborative practice and, and co-creation, this is a really wonderful book by Maya Havilland, who's an ANU academic, academic. It involves a lot of case studies from um, First Nations communities here and also from Chiapas in Mexico and a couple of other places. But she pulls out a couple of ideas and one of them is that idea of collaboration as synthesis. So the collaboration is the main mechanism through which meaning um, and in this case for the podcast in which decisions were made, um, the form change, shifts took place, um, the collaboration was the driver. It's, um, it's similar to that idea that and there is a book by this very name, is that the, the relationship is the project, not that the project creates relationships, that, you know, synthesis only occurs if you get the collaborative dynamics right. And that, um, and also I think the other idea that comes out of here is this idea that, um, you know, artistic collaboration is, essentially about creating something that is more than the sum of its parts. Mm -hmm. And that I think actually in the way that Bird's Eye View was constructed, it, the form actually mirrors that. So you've got all these tiny little segments, some of which involve one woman who's not involved in anything else, um, you know. But if you just had them alone, if you just had the stories alone, they wouldn't serve the purpose of, that the women intended the work to. But by stitching them all together um, and, and sort of underpinning that um, with a, a soundtrack and um, field recordings from inside the prison and making it something much bigger than the, the tiny um, segments, it sort of, for me, mirrors what I suppose the abolition process looks like is this, the, the generation of power and momentum through um, the summation of lots of different people doing bits of work, mm. which is not what, when you think of abolition, I think the word itself sounds like a smashing, like a, a single moment of smashing and undoing. But actually behind that is this sort of, you know, incremental collaborative practice where lots of people are approaching it through lots of different ways, you know, some of which we've been able to show today, but there's this, you know, there's an enormity sitting outside of that as well. Um, and I just wanted to say too that, that part of that role is um, the, the amount of institutional access that we have, I think we have an obligation to use it. So I'm actually not a dis uh, journalist by discipline. Um, it's something that I've learnt on the go. Um, but in the course of my, my work and my research, I wasn't really content to just shove it into journal articles and that would be it. Um, so actually approaching and engaging with people um, who have a really significant stake in this space 
be they families who are surviving an inquest, families who are mourning someone who's died in custody, be they people who are inside prison or otherwise entrapped in that system, like we have an obligation to use the small amount of institutional pressure that we can exert to widen the space by which they can participate in these discussions. And it's not necessarily us who's doing the, the talking or the insurgency or the resistant media. It's actually us who's just making that space for people who deserve to have that voice and should be leading these discussions to be able to do so in a context where every part of their life is controlled. Thank you so much. We. Um... We, we might wrap it up there. Um, our, our beloved listener, listeners are there, they're online, they're, they're concentrating, um, but they're not asking questions, which is absolutely fine because this is all stuff that takes time and, 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 and care to digest. So we're going to wrap it up and just say thank you so much to Alison Whitaker, Yo Bell and Rocket Bretherton for joining us um, today. And, um, yeah, thank you to my co-host Liam and to Andrew who's been live tweeting in the other room. Um, stress sweating in there um, and doing a great job. Um, thank you everyone so much. Um, the, we'll post um, a link on, the, on Twitter to the um, YouTube recording. This recording will, will stay on the live streaming link. It'll be there to watch and re-watch and download and cite and um, cherish for um, who knows how long to come, years to come. Uh, but yeah, thanks so much. And oh no, everyone. <laughs> forever. <laughs> Um, yeah, and thank you especially to our panellists for joining us today and for such um, wisdom and insight. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Yalu.